right, everybody, it is noon, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Archaeology of Range Creek Canyon. I'm Savannah Agardi. I'm the Compliance Archaeologist for the Utah State Historic Preservation Office. I'm filling in for Elizabeth, who had to attend another meeting at this time today. Um, we are hosting today's event in celebration of Nine Mile Canyon Stewardship Day and International Archaeology Day. Um, as with all these things in COVID times, um, these days are a little different. And so we usually gather in the canyon with lots of our friends, um, you know, at the Nine Mile Canyon Coalition and Project Discovery. But this year we're hosting uh, new and interesting talks related to Nine Mile Canyon each Wednesday through November. This week we have Shannon Boomgarden at the Natural History Museum of Utah with us to teach about archaeology in neighboring Range Creek Canyon. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, we are only Nine Mile Canyon adjacent. Uh, the archaeology in Range Creek shares a lot of similarities with Nine Miles. So um, thank you all for coming. Uh, my name's Shannon, director of the Range Creek Field Station. And I recognize a lot of your names as you were coming in. This is probably going to be um, a lot of things you've already seen, but I just plan to uh, share everything as if you've been there or have no idea what's going on. So, um, and I have slides that I want to try to get through, uh, but um, if there's something I didn't spend enough time on, please uh, let me know at the end and I'll go back and, and talk about it. So I just plan to introduce Range Creek, where it is, the setting, and some history of our project. And I will go through the archeology, span uh, show lots of cool pictures, and really focus on um, the sites and what we're going to do, record them and protect them. And then I'll end with just a little bit about our research questions and the experimental approach that we have been taking to uh, fill in some of the missing pieces. So, oh, and just a warning, I'm actually in range and I haven't been having any trouble with our internet, but um, so I apologize if I uh, freeze or anything. Um, so this is Range Creek Canyon, this leaf shaped pattern here draining into the Green River. And of course, here's Nine Mile Canyon, uh, roughly east west, while we drain north to south into, into the green. And onto that leaf shape pattern, you can see that the terrain is fairly rugged. Here's the book cliffs and the Highland Tavakuts Plateau here. And you're going to see this outline um, of the hydrologic basin. So this is the break where everything down from this, these edges into Range Creek uh, and drains into the Green Canyon. So you're going to see this pattern a lot on my maps. And um, we come into Little Horse Canyon here at about 9,000 feet over a pass. It looks like this, looking down into Little Horse Canyon. Um, the gates of the field station are here at about 7,000 feet where we have a campground uh, for visitors who are going to walk in or ride horses into the canyon. This is a helicopter shot of the campground. We have two weather stations here recording um, data by the second. And as you travel down the canyon, you'll see a lot of changes in topography and vegetation. So we dropped from 7,000 feet at the gate uh, through the canyon. You'll see it's winding and, and very narrow up in the, at about 6,000 feet. And then we get to the field station where um, it's the former Wilcox Ranch at about 5,000 feet. The canyon opens up a lot through here. And you can see the vegetation shifts a lot through um, more pine down through pinion juniper. And then you get to the mouth of the um, Range Creek and Green River where they come together at about 4,200 feet. So we're talking about a place with a lot of elevational change and changes in the environment that people are moving through and um, utilizing. And so I just wanted to get you familiar with this area. Uh, we've been working, and when I say we, I mean the Natural History Museum and the University of Utah, along with so many collaborators that I can't name them all. Uh, but we started coming in in 2002 with Jerry Spangler when the former Wilcox Ranch was going to sell um, and become state land. And this is the, in green, the actual outline of the lands that are part of the Range Creek Build Station. Uh, everything in black around that is BLM Wilderness Land. 
And in purple, these are sitla sections. And then in blue down here, are, there's still a little bit of private property in the canyon. So this green area is the one that we manage now as a field station. And primarily we do research there using a field school that runs um, June and July every summer. And we take 12 students in, usually undergraduates and a couple of graduate students and lots of collaborators. And we go in and do hands-on archeology span in the canyon uh, for those two months. Uh, during the field school. Uh, in 2009, we officially became the Range Creek Field Station and we established um, our mission, which is the scientific investigation of archaeology in the canyon, preservation and protection of the cultural resources. So we're managing 3,000 acres in the green uh, that controls access to all of this area, primarily BLM wilderness study area. Oh, it was wilderness study area. Sorry, last year it changed to wilderness. So I got to get used to saying that. Uh, there's 15 miles between the locked gates and then about six more miles to the Green River. This has been open down here. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but between these two locked gates uh, was fairly restricted by the Wilcox family for uh, a couple of generations. So there's now public access. Uh, you can get a day permit on our website. It's a dollar a year to be able to come in as many times as you want. We limit it to 28 people a day who can camp up here at the North Gate and then walk or ride horses into the canyon as far as you wanna go in a day and back to the, back to the um, campground. This is the field station headquarters. Uh, so this is the former Wilcox Ranch. So buildings of different ages, uh, we still use these buildings to run the field school and uh, manage the field station. So you can see this is our main building. And then we also have cabins um, dating as far back as 1930s that we um, have rehabilitated. Um, and we try to maintain all of these buildings and structures. And this is where the students camp every summer. And then we drive out from here each day to do survey and excavation and um, paleo environmental studies. So when we first started, um, we needed to think about how we were going to cover this large area systematically by surveying it to just to figure out where the sites are. So we draped the entire canyon in um, UTM blocks. So these are a thousand kilometers by a thousand kilometers. And then we randomly selected a 10% sample to uh, walk out and line up and physically survey all of these units just to see where sites are and where they aren't. Um, so we selected 44 blocks, that's a 10% sample, and we have completed 18 of those blocks so far. So you can see in pink are the ones that we have completed and the blue ones are still uh, to be done. And part of the reason those have not been done, even though we've been um, kind of nibbling away at this since 2002, is that the terrain looks like this and a lot of those blocks that were randomly selected overlap areas like the peaks of these um, difficult to walk areas. So we've, we've got another strategy where in addition to those blocks that we're trying to walk, we have also walked as many areas as we physically can um, along the creek, along the valley floor um, and up into the side canyons where we can both walk them and see the ground without hurting ourselves. And it's also where you might expect more people to live. So it makes sense intuitively to expect more sites uh, near the water source. And so this map shows, um, in addition to these random sample survey blocks that we have covered, uh, all the areas that we have systematically surveyed intensively in the canyon. And we're still working on that. So there are still Lots of areas that we need to take a look at, and that's what we do with the field school and the students each summer. Um, especially, you can see here, we always run back out and survey when there's a fire, too, because it clears out all the vegetation. We can you know, find 12 sites that were completely hidden when we surveyed it the first time. So I don't plan to go into a lot of detail on our research today. I just wanted to give you an overview of the canyon, but since SHPO and um, and other folks have been getting together a lot to talk about vandalism in Utah and protecting sites and starting a stewardship program. I did just want to uh, leave in here and talk a little bit about um, an early study that we did with Jerry Spangler and myself and Joel Boomgarden from uh, School and Institutional Trust Lands Administration, 
Uh, by about 2006, we'd recorded over 300 sites so far in the canyon, and we decided to um, look at vandalism that we had recorded in detail. So uh, we, we wrote a report together. It's in three parts. And the first part is Jerry Spangler's section where he um, found the photographs from the Claughlin Emerson expedition in the 30s, uh, part of which was in Range Creek Canyon. Um, and I believe part of it was in Nine Mile as well. And he found these uh, photographs from sites that were recorded in the 30s by these um, explorers and archaeologists. And he, we tracked down those sites to compare to how they looked now with how they looked in the 30s. And if you want to read more about that, um, he has a book now, The Crimson Cowboys, came out in 2018 that documents that, that research all over um, this area. Um, but I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, the analysis that led to how we manage the sites now that people are starting to come into the canyon more since um, it became public property. So um, here you can see just a little bit more of what those photographs look like. And then we go out and we document them with up-to-date photographs and uh, compare how things have eroded. You know, here's a capstone of the same granary. It's now on the ground over here, it's not up on top anymore and some of the walls have eroded. So, so all of that's been documented for as many sites as we could track down and compare to these historic photographs. And then I did a spatial analysis of the different types of vandalism or visitor impacts that had been uh, recorded up to 2006. Uh, this is how that sort of breaks down in the canyon. So uh, there were 339 sites in this analysis with a total of 80 sites that were vandalized um, in some way. Some of that was not intentional vandalism. So there's road construction and bulldozer activities just from um, the folks living in here for years running the ranch and um, managing their property. So some sites were damaged that way, but there were a large percentage that had looters pits in the features. Um, so structures like this had clearly been dug into and dirt tossed out of them. Uh, here's another set of storage cysts that had been looted. Some of these Waldo Wilcox told us about the damage. Uh, for example, this is a granary that he knows was shot at by a hunter. And then you can see bullet holes in this rock art panel here and some historic markings. And then this is um, an example of a place where folks who visited a site piled the artifacts up um, that we call a uh, looter's pile. So that having to do with artifacts, um, that or we uh, know that our artifacts were removed from the site. So uh, this is sort of how the impacts to sites break down in Range Creek. And um, what we figured out is that really it was the access points that had the most damaged sites located next to them. So this just shows how if you're standing at the north gate and you look for sites and as you walk um, south into the canyon, uh, the percentage of vandalized sites drops off pretty significantly. And it's the same when you're standing at the Wilcox Ranch where a lot of activities took place that might have damaged sites. And then you walk north towards the gate, you get a drop off in the number of vandalized sites there. And then we also found that most vandalism occurred within 200 meters of the dirt road that runs through the canyon. Um, here's another example just of some of the evidence of vandalism or um, visitor impacts that you see primarily outside of the gates towards the Green River. So here you can see a rope tied on where somebody, it's broken now, but not when we first started in the canyon, the rope came all the way down. So people had uh, tied up, climbed into this area. They've left ladders, they've left screens, and um, a lot of damage outside the gates primarily was what we, we found in the early days. Um, and we do have some artifacts where we recorded them one year and we've revisited the site and the artifacts are no longer there like this um, portion of a ceramic vessel. So we used the results of that vandalism study to um, build a monitoring strategy for how we would um, keep track of sites and visitation in the canyon. So what we did was we, we grouped the sites into three kind of risk categories. So class ones were higher risk. And those are sites that are within 400 kilometers of the um, gate where people are coming in now. And they're within 200 meters of the road. And then closer down to the south end where people would perhaps um, 
trespass into the canyon, we started to revisit these two um, groups of sites on a rotating schedule. And we do a complete re-record of the site so that we can see if anything has changed through time. Uh, we're looking not only for um, ac actual vandalism where someone purposefully um, hurt the site, which is pretty rare, but also impacts from people walking through the site, um, dropping garbage, uh, creating pathways, uh, knocking over features, moving artifacts around, those kinds of things. And then all the other sites are the class three sites, and we've recorded quite a few sites now. So those are those are taking longer to revisit, but we hope to revisit all the sites on a rotating schedule and get them um, looked at as often as we can. Okay, so what have we found? We have recorded over 500 prehistoric and historic sites in the canyon, and we roughly group them into these categories of site types, which I will walk through and show you some pictures. We have residential sites and storage sites, artifact scatters, uh, rock art sites, uh, a few rock shelters and alcoves, and then a few historic sites, um, mostly including cabins. Um, so let me show you some pictures of these. And, and some of the sites include all of these things. So they are not exclusive categories. So just uh, to show you, uh, it might look like just a big blob along the creek, but if I was to show you every individual site, that's exactly what it would look like. And that's because most of the sites are located uh, in the valley floor of the canyon and up onto the ridge lines a little bit. So uh, this just shows the density of, of all site types. Um, and you can see there's a fairly dense cluster in the center of the canyon, and then clusters here of all site types. And then out here, there's only maybe zero to five sites throughout the rest of the canyon. And so that's both a, a result of where we've surveyed and the terrain and proximity to water. So it's a little bit like you would expect it to be uh, with clustering near water. Okay, so definitely one of the things that's very similar um, that we share in common with Nine Mile Canyon is some incredible rock art panels, although um, a lot fewer than you find in Nine Mile. So these are just a few examples, and we had a graduate student um, compile uh, kind of a chapter on rock art for his dissertation, and he found there were 700 rock art figures at 130 sites in Range Creek. Um, he divided those up into roughly 353 abstract images, 174 anthropomorphs, 160 quadrupeds, and 53 representational. Um, so these are just a few examples of the uh, pictographs and petroglyphs in Range Creek. Um, very similar, I think, to Nine Mile Canyon. Uh, so we also find quite a few residential sites. Uh, there's over 100 sites that I would call residential, and these can be kind of subdivided into open residential, uh, those that are located down on the valley floor near the farm, farm areas uh, and alongside the creek. There's high elevation sites. They're located really high up on the uh, ridge lines overlooking the valley floor. And then there are a few that are more sheltered, so um, evidence of residential sites in the rock shelters. And the way that we defined a residential site is just has one or more rock alignment features like you see here. There's a lot of variability in what those rock alignment features look like. Um, and then there's a combination of artifact types, uh, usually some kind of midden or charcoal stained soil that's evidence that people lived there for uh, quite a while. Um, here's again just some of the variability in the rock alignments that we see. Um, and then there are also some evidence of residential sites that has no rock alignments with the um, residential structures. This is an area we, we didn't see any evidence here of a structure, but we did a test excavation and found a post hole, um, expanded from there and found an eight meter diameter uh, pit house structure with a clay rim hearth and um, no rock alignment uh, like we typically find. So something kind of looks like this if we were to reconstruct it. And again, most of those sites are located where they're just up off the floodplain area uh, where they would have been farming using the arable land and irrigation from the creek. We also have a few sites that we would call a village site. So they're just larger, they have more artifacts, more features uh, clustered together. There's 17 of those so far in the canyon that we've recorded. 
And we've excavated a, a couple of those, just very limited test excavations. Um, we want to keep these sites as intact as we can, so we only do um, a little bit of excavation. And uh, this is one of the sites, it's called Big Village. And we have excavated over a couple of years here. Um, these are the features that we've excavated. Um, and you can see, we've really just been questioning what are the differences between these surface manifestations of rock alignments in these different residential structures? Um, how do they look subsurface and looking for datable materials? Uh, this one, we didn't find anything subsurface uh, that was structural associated with the surface rock alignment. Uh, in this one here, we knew that it had been partially dug out and disturbed before it was really shallow. And all we found was this uh, slab lined floor um, with no burned material or anything that we could date. And then again, we found in this large open area, a burned collapsed structure with a central hearth, um, the edges just slightly dished up, no rock alignment around it. Um, and we were able to get some dates on that structure. We're currently working on uh, this excavation of Trench 6. And this one got fairly complicated in that um, many of the structures are built over top of other features. So um, this one trench, this limited testing is not gonna answer all of our questions. So we hope in the next year, if um, we're able to hold a field school next summer, to expand this excavation and answer more of our questions about um, this, surf this surface structure being built over top of this larger structure underneath. You can see walls and hearts and things underneath this other structure. So uh, still a lot of questions about that one. And then um, kind of like Nine Mile has the large towers. We don't have any towers, but we do have these high elevation sites um, where you see all of the um, characteristics of the residential sites that we see down on the valley floor. But uh, uh, we see them up at least 200 feet or more above the valley floor on these ridge lines. And we suspect that they're defensive in their placement um, up on these ridge lines and pinnacles. Uh, this is just one of those sites, um, a sketch map here showing kind of the diversity of features and things. This site is at least 900 feet above the valley floor. It has storage on site. It has uh, rock alignment features, um, trough matades, uh, everything you can think of that you would normally see at a Fremont residential site uh, close to the valley floor, you can see on this, this high elevation site. And you also see if you climb up um, above the site onto the very pinnacle that they have what looks like defensive um, rocks placed at the entrance of where someone might try to come up or, or some kind of shelter that would uh, protect them that seems uh, defensive in, in some way. This is the view from that site, uh, about 900 feet, looking north of Range Creek Canyon. And these are some of the artifacts from the site. So you do see the full suite of um, typical Fremont artifacts that you find on the valley floor. And then, of course, if you've visited Range Creek, you've probably seen some of the storage sites. They're uh, really incredible, uh, placed in these really difficult to access locations. And it's very similar to the granaries that you see in Nine Mile Canyon. Um, we've recorded 112 storage sites, and they include granaries, um, which are the above ground storage. They include cysts that are below ground and um, tool caches or material caches. And we just group them into um, roughly two types. They are the small cysts or small stone boxes. These are usually smaller and they're um, easier to access locations, usually closer to the valley floor or on a ledge that you can um, get to fairly easily without climbing gear. And then um, like Nine Mile, we have these granaries. We call them remote granaries. And there's some var variability in their um, construction. Some are on ledges, others are um, on the cliff faces and they actually build a ledge there to support the granary with this um, platform. So here you can see a large platform constructed here and the granary itself back here. Um, many of these you can climb a long ways and, and then um, get to them and others you have to repel to them. So climbers have helped us out a lot from uh, the geography department. Most of these photos are taken by Larry Coates. He and his 
um, brother climb to these for us safely and take pictures and measurements and help us document these. Um, we don't let the students climb to them. Here's just a few more pictures showing the variability in the construction methods associated with these granaries. You can see the fingerprints in the mud and willow bindings. Um, and this just kind of shows when you, when you first are looking for them, they seem hidden, but once you know where they are, like this one, you can really see um, a large area around if anyone was trying to access this granary. Once you know what you're looking for, um, you can monitor them from below and see uh, if anyone's trying to get into these granaries while you're away. Here's one other one. It was on the announcement for the talk. And here's Larry um, up above rappelling into this granary and taking photographs showing the um, intact structure. It's funny because right back here, I think this um, inscription says 1941. So uh, we talk about needing climbing gear to get in here, but um, people were getting into these uh, who are better climbers than us or are willing to take the risk. Uh, so this just summarizes the dates on the, on the sites so far, um, broken into different uh, artifacts and different uh, types of plants that we have dated. These all come from structures. This is all corn. And you can see this pattern of uh, most of our dates coming back right around 1050 AD, just no matter what we date, um, that's been the strongest pattern. We do have um, a very early date, I think it's 420 AD on a basket here. And then the most recent artifact date we have is on a tobacco bundle. Um, and I believe it was 1860. So just to summarize, we have people in the canyon as early as AD 420. Uh, this is the basket that's the oldest dated uh, item that we have dated in the canyon. Uh, but there's an intense Fremont occupation between 900 and 1200 AD, um, with most of the corn dating to about 1050. They have a high reliance on maize farming. Uh, we have found evidence of their use of maize, both from um, cores that we've taken in the farm fields where we find isotop isotopic values related to corn farming and we have found pollen in those. Um, we've been reconstructing um, the plant communities through coring in the, in the valley floor with the help of the Red Lab and um, Andrea Brunel and her students. And we have reconstructed the settlement patterns in Range Creek. This is something that we're still working on. Um, but for now, we kind of see a high elevation pattern with refuge sites located up on the ridge lines, and then primarily low elevation villages and small residences spread throughout the canyon along the valley floor, um, utilizing the creek. And then in the food storage, we see large remote granaries. Uh, we see more of those. And then we see fewer small hidden cysts uh, with easier access. So oh, Shannon, just are... really quickly, sorry. Somebody chatted yeah. me and said you lost your screen share. I'm still able to see your screen. Um, is, every, oh. is everybody else having that issue or? Okay, it looks like other people can see it fine. So carry on, sorry about that. Okay. I just have a couple more and then I'll take some questions. I'm trying to get, I know it's 1230, but um, so anyway, these are still the questions that we are working on. Um, a big one that we've started at the beginning was what was the environment like in the past? And we're still collecting a lot of proxy data from dendrochronology, pores on the valley floor, um, using pollen to reconstruct what the um, plants communities were like through time. Um, one of the things everyone always asks how many people lived in the canyon, and I still don't have an exact answer for that, but um, some of our research has helped us uh, using experiments to figure out how much corn we can grow in the canyon and how much water that takes. Uh, we're kind of narrowing down on that and think there were fewer people than we thought maybe 10 years ago. Um, we're looking at why the Fremont settled where they did. So um, as you could see in the um, maps of where the sites are located, there's a dense area of villages and other sites kind of centrally located in the canyon and then people spread out from there. And so we're looking at aspects of um, which areas were best for irrigation farming and trying to link them to whether that um, is uh, determining why people lo located themselves where they did along the creek. Uh, we're looking at costs and benefits of the storage and why you might invest in putting your uh, storage so high up. Again, it looks defensive. Um, 
And then we're looking at the return rates for irrigation farming and collecting quantitative data on that. And then also the return rates for collecting wild resources um, by collecting Indian rice grass and getting the numbers for that. And we've really shifted our focus um, to experimental research where we're out doing the things that we have questions about and trying to collect quantitative data for that, comparing it to ethnographic records and archeological records. Um, each of these would take their own um, hour long, at least lecture. So I'm not gonna go into details, but we have been building our own granaries, uh, similar in type to the Fremont granaries that we see here. Uh, filling them with corn and leaving them over winter and seeing, you know, this is a little bit of a competition with the students to see whose granary can hold up over the summer and um, whether they would live to the spring to be able to plant corn again. Um, this is Perrin Springer, our ranch manager. She's working on a project where she's leading students and, and volunteers out to collect and process Indian rice grass. Um, and thinking about the methods and the cost that it took uh, to um, harvest enough of this to, to feed yourself and see what the return rates are. Um, and then lastly, my, my main focus has been on farming in the canyon using only tools available to the Fremont a thousand years ago and recording all the costs that it would take to plant, burn off the field, um, dig ditches using only digging sticks, uh, building a dam, and then once you have the water flowing, keeping those ditches running, maintaining it, and seeing how much uh, corn that you can grow in the canyon for those efforts. Um, again, I mentioned at the beginning, this is not, certainly not all my work. There's been dozens and dozens of students, staff, volunteers, and collaborators, and um, also land managers that I want to thank for helping to collect all of this and protecting the range. So thank you. I'm going to not share. Stop Thanks, sharing. Shannon. That was great. Um, I love Ooh, all those uh, photos. They're just amazing to look at. Um, so we do have a couple of questions. I'm going to read them out loud in the chat. Uh, Steph, Steph and Drum asks, what are the historical indigenous tribes that lived in this area? Is there a reference name for any prehistoric native inhabitants? So I showed you the one date that we have on uh, that tobacco bundle. Uh, we think it's likely Ute, and we do have other evidence that Ute um, tribes were present in Range Creek. Very little evidence, but there was a, present, a presence of Ute in the canyon, and that's just um, based on a couple of rock art panels and then that tobacco bundle that we think was Ute. We don't have any other um, archaeological record of people um, after the Fremont who lived in the area. Um, and then we have the European settlers and evidence of that as far back, certainly as far back as 1930, but I think we have earlier records of that, um, of ranchers in the canyon. Okay, thank you. Uh, Troy Scotter asks, aerial photography showed diamond patterns in the canyon. Did you ever figure out what those were? No. Hi, Troy. Nice to hear from you. We haven't figured out what those are. I know some, you know, Joel was out trying to track them and, and follow them around and see if you could see them when you're on the ground, which is, which is really hard compared to those aerial photos that show them so well. But I don't know what those are. Well, maybe Question. someday we'll find out. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And Nicole Parmley. Yeah. yeah. Nicole Parmley asks, what is the most interesting thing you have found? Whoa, okay, let's see. Like the coolest artifact I personally have found, um, I think it would be a complete digging stick, a, ma a mountain mahogany digging stick. Um, and, you know, we don't find as many organic artifacts preserved um, in many of the sites because they're open and, and actively, you know, getting wet and dry and things moving around. But um, I found this digging stick in a shelter. And what's so interesting about it, I think, is that it had been recorded previously and I'd never been there and someone took me to the site. And it was a rock shelter that had um, painted handprints on the ceiling. And so I was looking up at those and I looked in a crack in the ceiling and I saw what looked like a little piece of cordage. And I said, there's cordage up here. And I reached up and I grabbed the end of this digging stick that had been bound and repaired 
with, with cordage on the end and I pulled it out and it's like a meter long. It's sharpened on the end. It's fire hardened. It still has dirt on it. And it had cordage binding a split in the end that was starting. So somebody had tied that back together to try and keep it intact and then cached it in the, in this crack in the ceiling. And so, um, I was excited that I found it when it had already been recorded and nobody looked up there. So, um, and I, I think it's only one of two digging sticks we've found in the canyon. So, um, I think those are. Kind of cool. Wow. That's very awesome. So somebody asked a question to me privately, so I'm not sure if everybody can see it on the chat, but Sari McCarty asks, did the inhabitants hunt or raise animals? What animals would they have raised? Um, we haven't found any evidence of them um, at site specific. Oh, actually we have one, we have one fragment of a jawbone from a domesticated dog. Um, so we do think they had um, domesticated dog. And I think there's a few rock art panels that you could say that looks like a dog in those rock art panels as well. And then I'm trying to think if we have any evidence of, of domesticated turkey. I, we have wild turkey running around the ranch all the time here. And it's really easy to um, domesticate them. If you have any corn to throw, they'll just go anywhere you want. Um, and so we do have those here, but I don't think we've found any evidence in the sites that they um, also had wild turkey. So they definitely hunted though. Um, you know, we have, we have zooarchaeological remains that have been identified. They had, um, and so we have found fish, um, deer, bunnies, you know, wood rats, those kinds of things in the middens of some of our excavations. Okay, great. Uh, Lane Miller asks, a pigment stick was found in the canyon, which was likely used to draw pictographs. Was it dated? Some Utah Ute pictographs were made using a pigment stick. No, uh, we, hit, we haven't dated it. It's on display currently on exhibit in the museum right now. So, um, so you can see that one, but we haven't dated it. That's a good idea. Um, and I just saw the question about the flute as well. And we, the University of Utah did not collect the flute. It was collected by um, other archeologists in the canyon and it went to the Price Museum temporarily. Um, and I can't remember if they dated it, but if they did, um, I think Jody Patterson was involved in the analysis of that flute. Um, it is currently put back at the University of Utah in their collections, but um, we didn't we didn't date it um, through the University of Utah. Okay, thanks. Um, Kirk Astroth asks, other than riding a horse or walking, can you ride a mountain bike down the road from the gate? No, we don't allow any mechanized vehicles um, past the gate in the canyon. Okay. Uh, Just uh, Makes sense. Um, Isabel, I'm going to say your last name wrong. I'm sorry. Osmussen asks, is there any evidence of trading or material sourced from outside this canyon? Yes, there definitely is. So we have found... Um, and sourced 22 pieces of obsidian. Uh, those uh, were found from five different sources up to 500 miles away in Idaho. And then there's some from Milford, Utah. Um, I would have to look up the others. And if you wanna email me on anything I can't remember the details on, I'm happy to um, let you know the details. But um, in addition to the obsidian, we have, um, we have pottery that is from the Four Corners region um Pueblo ancestral Pueblo people that has been either traded or transported into Range Creek. We have um olivella shell beads that we know come from the Pacific coast uh that have been traded or transported. Um, they could only have come from that area that made it into the into the Range Creek area. Um, and we have just recently found a couple pieces of turquoise and I'm not sure how to source those. Um, we have just two teeny tiny pieces and then one chunk that hasn't been modified in any way. So um, still looking into those and where they came from. I think those are the only artifacts that uh, we know came from outside of the canyon. 
Okay, thanks. Um, um, the next question is, a Keith Bateman asks, what was the percentage, what percentage of the food was meat? Um, that I don't know. Um, so we have not looked at any um, human remains in Range Creek Canyon and done any type of like isotopic analysis that could tell you the percentage of, of corn versus protein uh, that was eaten. If we look at just um, other Fremont sites, it's typically 80% corn. Um, that that has come up with those types of analysis of, of human remains. Okay. Um, Jim Royal asked, how, how have you involved Native Americans in your work? What have you learned from their participation that you wouldn't have otherwise? Um, well, we, we've, I've been thinking a lot about this lately, of course, as many people have. Um, over the years, we've had um, mostly participation from indigenous students who have taken the field school and worked with us there. So we've had students who take on Range Creek projects. They come in and they take the field school. Some of them have gone on to work CRM jobs that have done the Range Creek field school. Um, and um, at least two of them have done master's degrees um, where they, they worked on Range Creek projects. Um, one of them was the Obsidian project. Uh, so, all of our work is done by students and the staff there. So that's been the primary um, way that indigenous students have been involved in Range Creek. We um, have also had a Ute um, elder who participates in the field school um, most, most years. One year he spent the entire summer with us, but usually he just comes down to visit and talk and teach and, and interact with the students. Um, and But he has been a teaching assistant for us, which I think that's probably been the biggest influence on um, understanding other perspectives from folks who um, have grown up in this area and um, have a connection to the, the people that lived here in the past. Um, our research is really focused on a scientific approach. And so it's nice to have their perspectives as well, um, making us think um, outside of, of our own narrow scientific approach. Um, and so we could certainly do more, I think, in getting people involved. Um, and we're really open to collaborations, but I think students are the best route for interactions and, and getting their perspectives. Yes, I agree. That's very cool. Um, Steve White asks, when making pottery, where would they go to gather, gather the clay? Um, so that's really interesting. This is this is something um, very much related to Nine Mile. Um, if you've read uh, Jerry Spangler's book on Nine Mile, he talks about the the pottery looks like it was not made in Nine Mile, and it's the same in Range Creek. So we don't have any clay sources in Range. Um, maybe we have clay sources, but what we don't have are the temper sources that we see in a lot of the Fremont pottery. So we find primarily a grayware pottery that has um, basalt temper, and there is no basalt in Range Creek. So we suspect that either they transported those materials in here, which would be really heavy and come from a long ways away, or they brought the pottery in um, or traded for it. So it, we have no evidence that they were making pottery in Range Creek right now. And I think it's the same for Nine Mile, if I remember what I've read in... Um, in, in Jerry's Nine Mile book, that it's the same there. He thinks a lot of the pottery was coming from the Uinta Basin. Wow, that's really interesting. Um, thanks. So Dave Christensen asks, regarding your experiments with storage, have you created any higher elevation granaries and tested them against lower? We have not. So we only started um, this granary uh, experiment project in 2015. And it's been a learning curve just figuring out kind of how to do it. So that was our pilot study. And then um, all of the locations, uh, for one thing, we're, we're, we're modifying the environment a little bit. We're building something. So we don't want to have an impact on any um, actual archaeological sites. So we're a little bit limited in where we can, we can put these. And then we only want to do it safely. And since we are making the students actually go to the water source to get water, so that's usually the creek, they have to 
they have to carry all the supplies that they need to make mud back to the location where they're going to build the granary. So um, even just building them at low elevation in a, in a shelter is extremely difficult work. And we don't want to endanger anyone by having them have to climb, you know, carrying buckets of water or mud or um, however they choose to kind of solve that problem of needing to um, get water high up into a cliff. So for now, we fo focus really on just the cost of building the structure itself. And if there are techniques um, and uh, maybe the amount of time you spend on different techniques that make it more uh, resistant to pests. And we think that um, the structure itself really was all about keeping pests out of the granary, keeping water out of the granary, things that could damage the corn, and then placing it wherever they placed it in the environment had more to do with keeping people out um, because most of the granaries that we record are completely full of pack rat middens. So putting them up high didn't keep out pests. It might've kept out bears and larger larger animals like that, but it certainly didn't keep rodents out or, you know, they can climb a cliff straight up. Um, so for now we're focusing mostly on the construction and aspects of having to carry supplies on foot to the place that you're going to build it. And then seeing if you can, for your level of investment and, and how you kind of chose to solve that problem of keeping pests and water out, could you keep corn until the next year? And, um, maybe in the future we can build them high up. It would be really cool. <laughs> yeah, that would be, and um, experimental archaeology is so important to um, learning what we know about the past. And, you know, those pack rats, I'm sure they were pesky uh, for Fremont people, but uh, they are really amazing for archaeologists to do that pack rat midden, uh, midden analysis. Yeah. Um, so they're good tools, good research tools. Um, Ron and Susan Sturdies asked, could you please show the first slides again and do a basic review of the types of drawings? I'm not sure if they mean the rock art drawings. Maybe Ron and Susan, you can take yourselves off mute and, and ask your question. Yes, we, or, we, learned, we learned a lot of this stuff long ago and I'd kind of like a little review of those drawings and, and the types of things you find on the side of the canyon. Um, let me share again. Thank you so much. I know it's kind of basic, but we really no. Um, that's okay. So you you're thinking you want to look at the um, like site types. Uh, no, the um, the one where you showed the pictographs and yes. Sorry, I should have gone back. Like this. It's the pictographs where it's the drawings that are on the wall of the like, yeah, yeah. there you go, that's it. Yeah, so these are the examples I show. There's there's way more than this, but um, these are these are the pet, these are the pictographs here. So these are painted um, and, and here, here. So these show anthropomorphic figures. Um, usually the Fremont have them um, with a triangular body and usually some type of headdress or decoration. Um, you can see adornments, ear fobs. These kind of look a lot like, um, if any of you have seen the Hillings figurines or, or other Fremont figurines that are um, on display at the, at the museum in Price, those came out of Range Creek and they're very similar to a lot of the anthropomorphic figures that you see. And I was mentioning before, some of the, Rock art shows what might be small, a small domesticated dog, um, but more of them show um, elk or deer. Um, some of them have like abstract symbols. We're not entirely sure what they are, but there's a lot of patterns that look like a snake perhaps. Um, I don't study rock art. I study more um, its distribution, but not um, trying to make any um, claims about what it represents or or what it means, but um, uh, do you have any specific questions that I might be able to answer or or someone who knows rock art better in here like Troy might be able to answer? Well, yeah. Nicole Parnley does ask, how does touching the rock art ruin it? Oh, right. So yeah, we encourage visitors not to touch the rock art because there are 
um, oils in your fingers that can damage it. So um, it's best not to put your hands on it, just take pictures. Um, or, and in the past, folks used to like chalk it to make it look better in the pictures. And that I think can be very damaging as well. Um, but I, I think it's just the oils in your hands that when you touch artifacts or uh, mostly the rock art that it can, um, it can degrade it. Yes, touching rock art is very damaging to it. Um, yes. <laughs> so Leo Hardy asks, for those ring rock alignment sites that you've excavated, were there any remnants of pit houses exclusively or were some other structures or had other functions? Right, so that's been kind of the interesting thing. When we first started to record sites like this, so here's kind of, um, a uh, representative sample of the variability of what you see on the surface. So most of the rock alignments in Range Creek look like this one here in the corner. They're a single forced, um, usually circular alignment of rocks. I think the average size is three and a half meter diameter. Um, and, you know, before we excavated, we were calling all of them pit houses. Everybody referred to them as pit houses. And so now when I say rock alignment, it's because we have excavated, um, I think maybe six of them now, and they're all a little bit different. So, um, you know, I showed you just this one site that we excavated here. Um, and, you know, this one up here was not a pit structure. Uh, it had no structural interior, like it had no... Um, floor, it had no interior hearth, it had no post holes, um, nothing that would tell us that it was structural at all. It's just the surface rock alignment. Uh, this one uh, is the only one I've ever seen that has this, um, uh, this rock floor with nothing burned. And that's, that's in the center. We're always kind of aiming for the center, hoping to get a, a sampling of um, structures that were buried within it. It had no prepared floor other than this circle of stones. It had no collapsed roof, um, none of the telltale signs of a pit house. So again, I'm not entirely sure what this structure was, although I know that it was damaged. Um, and then this one, outer rock alignment, was a pit structure. So it it's hard to tell, but it's, it's a slight depression that um, comes up on the edges. And it was, it had a, um, like a thatched roof with adobe over top and it collapsed and burned in place and then a clay rim hearth at the center, and then post holes around the hearth. Um, so, so this one was a pit house, and this one has several different types of structures. So this one is the remains of a, a surface structure with at least two course left. The surface has rocks all over from the walls eroding um, in all directions that so when we looked at this one uh, before excavation, it, it just looked like a kind of a rubble mound. Uh, but this edge of the wall right here goes over top of a clay rimmed um, rock, rock lined hearth that uh, was completely filled with ash. Um, it's associated with a collapsed and burned roof. It's probably hard to see. And that structure so far looks like it's about 10 meters in diameter. And then this one is about half the size sitting on top of it. Uh, I don't know all the answers to what's going on here, but I, I believe that the structure associated with this hearth is a pit structure, a shallow pit structure, really large. And then there's a surface structure over top of it. And then there's some other features over here that um, I'm not sure about. And then we've excavated another site um, called Mojo. Uh, this is the map of that site. And uh, we looked at this large rock alignment and we found no structural remains associated with it, but it's uh, kind of an extension of another series of, of rubble mounds. And then back here with just this um, small kind of half circle that was just a single course alignment of boulders kind of square in shape, that is a pit house, a perfectly um, typical Fremont pit house. Oh, looks like I drew on here now. <laughs> so there's some variability in what the rock alignments are. Uh, we believe some of them might just be like kind of the edge of a like a ramada that was a background 
like a, a brush um, surface structure that is now gone but left no uh, remains below the surface of the rock alignment. Okay, thanks. So it is 101, so we're going to start wrapping up. There is two more questions in the chat um, that maybe you could answer really quickly. Nicole Parmley asks, what is the most difficult part about excavating the trench? Um, hmm. Well, I think it's probably just keeping track of everything. So when we excavate, it's really important for us to know um, because we are archaeologists, we don't want to damage a site, but excavation is certainly going to disturb those um, those areas that we remove. You can't put it back the way it was. So um, I think it's just keeping track of where you are at all times, taking extremely detailed notes and drawings and um, um, using a, like a total station to map. So you always know what level you're at, um, both horizontally and vertically. So I would say the most um, tricky part of excavation isn't, you know, digging the trench itself. It's the making sure that you've kept track of everything that you removed um, and that you could go three months from looking at it, pull out your notes and know exactly what you did and how you did it and where everything came from. So um, detailed note taking, drawing pictures, scaled drawings, bo photographing as you go. Um, so it's a slow process. That's probably um, frustrating too, to go that slow. I know students are like, can't we just take this up? I'm like, go oh, take notes. Um, so, uh, it's a slow process that requires a lot of patience. Yeah. Um, Laura Cho asked, can you tell us a bit about what kind of volunteer opportunities you have? Um, yeah. So as you saw from my images, Rain Creek is extremely remote. It's not like nine mile and that you can just drive there easily. Um, so we usually just take volunteers from our pool of volunteers at the museum who have gone through the process of becoming a museum volunteer officially and um, had kind of a lot of training uh, as far as like dealing with artifacts and working at the museum. We've also had USAS folks come in, um, if you're familiar with that program, it's been a while, but they helped a lot in the early years when we were recording hundreds of sites really quickly. Um, and so USAS is the way to get involved and because we're hoping to have them help us more, especially with those revisits. So I'd like to revisit more sites and that's something USAS could help with um, as well as our volunteers at the museum. Um, so if you're interested in volunteering, I would sign up to become a museum volunteer. Um, and then we just send out calls. And one of the, one of the bigger things that we need help with is our, um, planting corn and um, doing our experimental wild food collection in the spring before the field school starts when I, I don't have students. So I really rely on volunteers for those projects to get up and moving. And that's something maybe people aren't as interested in, I find. Uh, most people want to go hike and see rock art and go to sites. And you can certainly do that when you come volunteer. But um, the projects that we need the most help with are... Um, like facilities maintenance and um, experimental work. Uh, so I really appreciate if anyone wants to get involved in that. Yeah, that kind of stuff is definitely just as important as, as the archeology, span you gotta maintain yeah. everything. Um, just really quickly, Katie Corneli from the Prehistoric Museum, she looked into if the Range Creek flute was dated and she says it was not dated. There was an optical luminescence date from some internal deposits, but she does not have the date on hand. So definitely a future project right. there. Um, and Nicole Parmley asks, it looks like our, it's our last question. What happens if you accidentally break something? Oh, well, you feel terrible, but <laughs> I have, I've broken one thing that I can think of. And I tell you, you'll never forget it ever your whole life because I dropped a drill you guys know what a drill looks like. It was about this long. It was gorgeous and perfect and intact. And I dropped it and it broke into three pieces. And um, the only thing I can say is, you know, it'll teach you to be very, very careful uh, moving forward because you can't, you can't fix it. But yeah, I can attest uh, to that. It's I didn't get fired. 
yeah, we're human too, right? We can't be perfect. Um, so it does happen, unfortunately. And all you can do is just try not to do it again, I guess. Yeah, um, for sure. So I think that about does it for today. If you guys have any additional questions, Shannon did share her email in the chat and we can also share it in a follow-up email to all the meeting participants so she can answer any of your questions. Um, I also shared some links in the chat about um, the SHPO site stewardship program. So if you guys are interested in becoming a site steward, um, we are, are now have a new program where you can become a site steward. And then also I shared the link to next week's presentation, which is a talk with Project Discovery alumni, um, including information about how high school students can get involved in archaeology. And I shared the link for that as well, but you can find it on the Utah SHPO's uh, Facebook page. And then I also shared the link to the YouTube page for the Utah SHPO where this presentation and all of our presentations are recorded and available for you to watch. Um, so that just about does it for today. Thanks everybody for joining. Thank you, Shannon, so much for that wonderful presentation. I'm glad you were able to get your internet back up and running and um, we really enjoyed oh, it. <laughs> Everyone have a good Thank afternoon. You all. Bye. Thank you.